continue. Hi, uh, Chris, how are you? Hello, fine, thank you. Okay, <laughs> welcome everybody. This is the May 5th Board of Health meeting, Amherst Board of Health. And pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so. There is an online Zoom link at the top of the Board of Health agenda found on the Amherst Board of Health website. And at the bottom of the agenda, there are directions for dialing. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the pro proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite our best efforts, we will post on the Board of Health website an audio recording um, of this meeting as soon as possible. Also, all Board of Health minutes can be accessed on the Amherst Board of Health website. So I'm gonna open the meeting with a roll call. So Maureen, Maureen Malay. Present. Tim, Tim, are you there? Lauren. Here. Nancy, here. And Steve is unable to attend today. So we will have five minutes of uh, public comment. Um, participants, I don't, attendees. I do not <clears throat> see anyone raising their hand right now. Okay. So I think with that, we will just move into old business. So the first part of old business, um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce two outstanding UMass public health students. We have Bailey Glenn and Emily Connors, and they have been working on the first phase of our community assessment collecting the demographic data and the best if they can of some of the vital statistics. So I am gonna turn it over to Bailey and Emily. Are you there, Bailey? Yes, I'm here. Okay, is Emily there too? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So we'll turn it over to you. Okay. And I had emailed the, the link for the report to all board members. Did you get it? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen then. Um, someone just has to enable um, screen sharing, whoever yep. the host is. Can you enable the screen sharing, Jen? Jen? Uh, yeah, Jen. I'm just, okay, I, okay. I don't know how to do this. If I make you co-host, will that be able to? Yeah, or if you're the host, oh, actually, I think I got it. So who can share? Good, I think I was able to fix it. Let's see. Get this on my screen. Okay. You guys should be seeing the front page mm -hmm. of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Emily, do you want to take it away? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our presentation of uh, phase one of the Amherst Community Health Assessment. So um, here's a quick rundown of what we'll be going over in our presentation. We're going to start with a quick introduction of the project and the process that we followed. Um, and then we'll cover demographic information from the US uh, 2020 census. And next we'll go over census track level prevalence data from the places health data. And then last, we will go over county level mortality data from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. All right, so um, just a quick introduction. 
Uh, community health assessment is a process of identifying key health needs, assets, and challenges of the community through systematic comprehensive data collection and analysis. Um, our intentions for this project are to give the Amherst Health Department, Board of Health, and other community groups comprehensive information in order to identify needs, prioritize decisions, identify ways to reach at-risk disenfranchised populations, address systematic health problems and concerns of our community members, promote equity, and guide advocacy efforts and policy development. Um, all right, so here's an outline of the process of completing the community health assessment. Um, phase one, which is what we're focusing on today, involves synthesizing descriptive and quantitative data, including demographics and general health status and population vital statistics, um, and providing a written report. Um, then in phases two and three, which be working on in the summer and fall of 2022, um, we'll work on descriptive, quantitative, Qualitative data collection, including determin determinants of health, uh, government and policymaking, and community members' views. We will review, analyze, and pre present this data, um, set health priorities, develop a community action plan, and write and disseminate a report. Um, okay, so just a quick overview of the census tracts. We figured we would provide this map to make sure everyone could follow along um, with the different tracts as we discuss them throughout the presentation. So uh, census track 8203 corresponds to North Amherst. Uh, track 8204 is UMass. Um, 8205 is Amherst Center. 8206 is Central, Central Amherst. Um, 8207 is East Amherst, 8208.01 is South Amherst, and 8208.02 is Hampshire College. Okay, so now we'll get into the demographics data from uh, the 2020 U.S. Census. So in terms of age distributions across all Amherst census tracts, the majority of the population falls within the ages of 15 to 24. Um, this is especially true for tracts like 8204, which is UMass and 8208.02, which is Hampshire College. Um, in the remaining census tracts, there is somewhat uh, of a wider spread of ages, uh, these tracts being North Amherst, Amherst Center, East Amherst, and South Amherst. But it is important to note again that even in the tracks with wider spreads, uh, college age students do still make up the majority of the population. Next, um, we can see here the distribution of gender, male versus female, in each of the census tracks. So um, you can kind of see that across all of the tracks, there is a fairly even split of males versus females. North Amherst is uh, probably the one that has the biggest difference in males versus females. Um, there being about 700 more males than females. Um, but again, it's, it's mostly evenly split among all of the census tracts. Um, all right, so here we outlined the estimated Hispanic population um, in each census tract. So we can see that um, 8204, which is UMass, has the largest estimated population of Hispanics in Amherst with 1,006, um, followed by North Amherst with 631 estimated Hispanic individuals. And next we have um, we'll cover race distribution. So uh, we found that in all census tracts, the majority of people were white. Um, this ranged from 56.1% um, at the lowest to 72.5% at the highest percentage of white individuals. Um, so because of this, we decided to further break down the distribution into Black or African Americans and Asian individuals to get a better idea of the next most common races um, in each census tract. So we can see that um, in most other tracts, Asians make up the second highest racial percentages uh, with the one exception, exception being 
uh, census tract 8208.02, which is Hampshire College, um, where Black or African Americans made up the second highest racial percentage. All right, so now I'll take over and just talk a little bit about some more demographics. So marital status was evaluated in individuals 15 or older and categorized as now married, widowed, divorced, separated, or never married. Um, almost 100% of individuals were never married in census tracts such as UMass, Central Amherst, and Hampshire College. And these tracts are thought to be predominantly college students. So that kind of makes sense with the demographic there. Um, and then there was a more even split between the never married and now married. So about 50-50 in other population and in the other census tracts with a very small amount being widowed or divorced or separated. Um, so then we'll get into educational attainment. Unfortunately, educational attainment was categorized inefficiently. Uh, we felt like the categories overlapped each other. Um, nonetheless, uh, across all tracks, individuals predominantly reported being high school graduates or higher. Um, and then the three top categories were high school graduate or higher, bachelor's degree or higher, and graduate or professional degree. Um, and so these range from um, the high school graduate or higher ranges from at lowest 35.6 to 46.2, the highest bachelor's degree or higher range from 7.5 to 27.9, and the graduate or professional degree range from 1.7 to 19.6, depending on census, the census tract. Um, so then we want to look at languages. So across all census tracts, approximately three quarters of the population only spoke English at home. Um, so the other quarter of individuals spoke one of the following languages, which were categorized as Indo-European, Asian, or Pacific languages, and then Spanish, or other, which other was not very common, so it's not shown on this chart. Um, so then depending on the census tract, it appears that Indo-European and Asian Pacific languages are the second most spoken language of the area. And again, this is probably depending on the racial distributions that Emily showed. Um, so then next we had household income, um, which varies pretty greatly depending on the census tract here. So the first one we have is 8203, which is North Amherst. And I would say this is fairly evenly distributed, but you do see the highest percentage of individuals is in the 100,000 to 150,000 range. Um, but then when you get to track 8204, which is UMass, you will see that um, over 80% of the population is making less than $10,000 annually. So that's probably a lot of the students. And then um, there's also just under 20% making the 75 to 100 grand. Um, so then we move on to Amherst Center, which again, more distributed, um, but you do see over 20% of individuals following the 15 to 25. So this could be grad students, students with a little more income living off campus as what we hypothesize. But then moving to 8206, this is Central Amherst. Um, again, it's much less evenly distributed. You have a lot of um, people making higher household incomes here, possibly maybe where professors live. Again, more research would have to be done to identify who are these populations, but just the spread is definitely not distributed well in that area. Um, and then 8207, which is East Amherst, and then 8208.01 is South Amherst. And again, these are um, fairly evenly distributed with a big, with, with about 20% in each making the, over the 200,000 mark. So now we're gonna move into the places data. So places health data is provided by the CDC and provides 2019 health data by census tract. So data areas that they provide include health outcomes, prevention, health risk behaviors, and health status. Um, so we will be sharing a highlight of all the work we did. Um, so we'll be presenting what Emily and I found to be the most important, um, but for more data, we like would refer you to our report because that has a lot more of our graphs. Um, so to start off, they, we want to look at high blood pressure. So on the left, we have high blood pressure prevalence in individuals 18 or older. And on the right, we have um, a graph showing people who are actually taking high blood, measure, pre, high blood pressure medication among those who actually have high blood pressure. 
So if you have high blood pressure, are you taking your medication? So for the prevalence of high blood pressure in Amherst ranges from 5.7% to 25.4, um, with the highest prevalences being observed in East Amherst, South Amherst, and Amherst Center. And then the prevalence of taking high blood pressure medication among those who have high blood pressure in Amherst ranges from 13.4 to 73.3%, with the lowest prevalence being observed at Hampshire College. Um, and what should be noted about all this health data is that it is not age adjusted. So for some medical conditions that are going to be high, um, more common in older populations, you're going to see just lower numbers in the student dominated areas. Um, so now we're going to look at high cholesterol. So on the left, um, high, the prevalence of high cholesterol in Amherst ranges from 6.2% to 24.6%. Um, with the highest prevalences being observed in South and East Amherst. Um, and then we looked at cholesterol screening prevalence and the prevalence of cholesterol screening in Amherst ranges from 65.7 to 86.7 with the lowest prevalence being observed at UMass. So mental health and depression, which we find these numbers to be fascinating, but also pretty high. Um, so the prevalence of two weeks of poor mental health, which is again is self-identified um, in Amherst ranges from 13.7 to 30% with the highest prevalence being observed in UMass. This is quite a big jump um, than the other areas. So it shows a need to focus on mental health within the UMass population. Um, and then just looking at depression prevalence, again, prevalence of depression in Amherst ranged from 20.2 to 29.8 with UMass again being the highest. So definitely um, a possible population to look at for mental health. Um, so next we have obesity and physical inactivity. So for obesity, the prevalence was 13.7 to 24.4 with the highest prevalence being observed in East Amherst. Um, and then the prevalence of physical inactivity in Amherst ranged from 17.4 to 30.1 um, with the highest prevalence being observed at UMass. So risky behaviors, which for our purposes include current smoking and binge drinking. So the prevalence of current smoking in Amherst ranged from 7.7 .7 to 15.7, um, with the highest prevalence being observed at UMass. And then for binge drinking, the ranged from 20.1 to 30.7, with the highest prevalence being observed in central Amherst. So other common chronic diseases that we just want to go over a little bit was the prevalence of diabetes, which ranged from less than 1% to greater than 8% with the highest prevalence being observed in East Amherst. And then we wanted to also look at coronary heart disease. So the prevalence of coronary heart disease ranged from less than 1% to almost 6% with the highest prevalence being observed in Amherst Center. And then one last thing that we thought was really nice that we could find data on is lack of health insurance for individuals between 18 and 64. So lack of health insurance in Amherst ranged from 7.3 to 11.8% with the highest prevalence being observed at UMass. So these possibly that these student populations are not getting access to the um, health insurance that they may need. Um, Emily, are you there? I, I think Emily may have frozen, so I will um, start talking about her data until she gets back. Her Wi-Fi just cut out, so she'll be back in a minute, but I'll get started. So the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation data, um, this is going to be county level mortality data. So these are gonna be death rates that we're gonna be comparing um, county level rates from Hampshire County to state level rates at Massachusetts and then to country level rates of the US. So first we have all cause and non-communicable diseases. So for Hampshire County's all cause mortality was around 712 per 100,000 in 2014. And this was lower than both the state of Massachusetts and the US rates. Um, and again, I should mention that the, all this data is the most updated data was from 2014. So 
it's what we had. It's not necessarily ideal because it's pretty old, but it's what we're gonna work with. Um, so then going to the non-communicable diseases. So Hampshire County's mortality rate for non-communicable diseases was about 662 per 100,000. Um, and this was actually higher than the state of Massachusetts by a little bit, but still lower than the US rate. So we're, you know, as you'll see, Hampshire County is doing pretty good compared to the rest of the world, um, but there's always still room for improvement. Um, so more non-communicable diseases and these um, focus specifically on the heart. So Hampshire County's mortality rate for atrial fibrillation and flutter was around 8.2 per 100,000, um, which was actually higher than both Massachusetts and the US. Um, but then when we, we moved to cardiovascular disease, which is a big killer around the world, and for Hampshire County, it, the mortality rate was 216 per 100,000. Um, this was higher than Massachusetts, but again, lower than the United States. Um, and then for ischemic heart disease, the mortality rate was around 127 per 100,000. And this was lower than both the state of Massachusetts and the US rate. So now we will move on to other non-communicable diseases that affect different parts of the body. So we'll look at COPD. So mortality rate for COPD was 38 per 100,000. And this was higher than the state of Massachusetts, but lower than the US rate. Um, so then we had diabetes, urogenital and endocrine dis diseases. And these mortality rates were uh, 44 for Hampshire County, um, which was actually lower than the state and the US. And then similarly for cirrhosis and chronic liver diseases, there was about 13 per 100,000. And this was again, lower than both the state of Massachusetts and the US rates. So now we'll talk about stroke, both ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. So Hampshire County's mortality rate for ischemic stroke was about 31 per 100,000. Um, and this was actually higher than the state of Massachusetts, but lower than the US rate. And then for hemorrhagic stroke, the mortality rate was around 13.5 per 100,000. And this was higher than the rate for the state of Massachusetts, but lower than the US. So then mortality rate for all cancer or neoplasms, um, the mortality rate was around 190 per 100,000. And this was actually just about equal to the state and the US rates. But you'll notice that these cancers, even though we have equal mortality rates, the actual cancers per each state will vary. Some will be higher and some will be lower. So for breast cancer, our mortality rate was around 14 per 100,000. And this was higher than the rate for the state of Massachusetts, but lower than the US rate. And then for cervical cancer, it was a very low 1.44. Um, but this was still higher than the rate of Massachusetts, but lower than the overall US rate. And then lastly, um, ovarian cancer had a mortality rate of 5.4, and this was higher than both the state of the Massachusetts and US rates. So something to keep an eye out for. So other cancers we have here is prostate cancer, had a mortality rate of about 10 per 100,000, and this was also higher than both the state and the US rates. Um, and then testicular cancer, which is very, very um, low all around the world, um, was had a mortality rate of 0 0.1 per 100,000 and was very similar to the state and the US rates. <clears throat> and then moving on to bladder cancer. So the rate for bladder cancer was around six per 100,000 and this was higher than both the state and the US rates. So now we wanna talk a little bit about risk behaviors. So Hampshire County's mortality rate for alcohol use disorders was 3.6 per 100,000 in 2014. And this was actually lower than the rate for the state of Massachusetts, but higher than, than the US rate. So it's something that Massachusetts definitely um, deals with. And then Similarly, looking for mortality rate for drug use disorders was around 10 per 100,000. And this was lower than both the state of Massachusetts and the US rates. 
And then we wanted to look at self-harm and the mortality rate for self-harm was about 10.4 per 100,000. And this was lower than both the state of Massachusetts and the US rates. So some overarching conclusions. Oh, Emily, you're back. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I've never, my Wi-Fi is completely not working. So I just joined on my phone. I'm sorry about that. It's all right. I, I got to the conclusion page. So I'll start the conclusion page and then have you wrap up the next steps. Okay, so our overarching conclusions from the work that we've been doing is that the data that we have access to is very flawed. So the places data was not age adjusted. So certain tracks were heavily influenced by the student population. You're not gonna think that the, that area has a particular issue because it's such a dominated by younger individuals. So it's really hard to pair, compare certain rates of diseases. Um, and then the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation mortality rates were from 2014 and were only at the county level. So there could be other towns impacting it other than Amherst. And this data is very old in the, what would be considered in the health world to be very old. Um, and then lastly, we, we do not know what demographics are behind the health data. We know the demographics and we know the health data, but we don't know if there's certain races or certain subpopulations that are being more affected by certain health conditions because we don't have access to that. Um, but then to talk about areas of concern, so we identified mental health, depression, and risk behaviors to be a concern of our area. Um, we thought those rates were pretty high, um, especially around the college campuses. Um, and then our overarching conclusion is that more specific data is needed to draw conclusions and to begin to understand um, where, ent where interventions are needed most and what interventions are needed most. Okay, so um, where do we go from here? Um, looking forward, phase two, um, I'll be working on this throughout the summer and um, also in the fall on phase three. Um, but in phase two, we'll be focusing on determinants of health. So housing ca characteristics, economics, transportation, recreation, education, places of worship, um, library services, law enforcement, fire departments, communications, uh, environment and healthcare services, as well as government and policy making. And then beyond phase two, we really suggest that a focus should be put on collecting data that's more relevant and representative of the Amherst community. Um, so whether that be through surveys, focus groups, key informant interviews, um, these are all gonna be part of phase three. So hopefully this will help us gather some more accurate data um, and having more detailed and relevant data on the community will supplement the findings of phase, phases one and two and really allow for the development of more effective interventions in areas of concern that we outlined. So thank you for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask us those. And we also just wanted to say quick thanks to Nancy for all your support throughout phase one. You were really a great mentor and helped us along the way. You're most welcome. You are great, great professional students, outstanding. <laughs> Board members and Jen, do you have any questions? Also, I want to thank Lillian for, for her help. She came to our, our meetings and um, helped with processes. No, I, I just want to say thank you, Bailey and Emily. Emily, I look forward to working with you over the next two semesters. You know, you have this great foundation so, you know, research translation, you know, more information, how do we get it working? And Bailey, are we saying goodbye to you? Are you graduating? Yes, and unfortunately I'm graduating or fortunately, I don't know which one, but yes, unfortunately <laughs> I'm leaving the health department and work because I am graduating. Thank you both. Board members, do you have any questions? I would just yeah, I would just say thank you. And even though the information, the data is a little past 
castaways do, um, it, it's still informative. So thank you. I, I found it very helpful. And then when you look at the different census tracts, and I, I talked to, to Bailey and Emily about that. Um, so Amherst, Cent Central Amherst, 06, that's a big piece is, is Amherst College. So you can, you can see the three census tracts where the three colleges are. Um, but then also looking at, and this is what we'll be looking at in our other phases, is where some of the apartment complexes are. And um, I was very um, curious about the data with hypertension and people taking medications and not taking their medication. Um, so I think it's it's a good start for us to start looking at. And then when we get the phase two data, putting that together, and then with the quali uh, qualitative data of phase three, we'll have um, a lot more to work with. I have and to say, I was surprised by the percentage of people without insurance, especially at UMass, because I think isn't that generally required of students to have insurance? Um, I know at the other four colleges it is, but um, you know it just surprised me. You know, in Massachusetts, that we have nine percent of people without insurance in in Amherst. So that'll be interesting to suss out. I think. And I wonder if that's with um, people uh, without U.S. citizenship and how that affects um, insurance. Yeah, like I, I worked at Mount Holyoke for years and every student was required to have insurance. And, and most, and then I think that was part of what, it was built in, I think, for our international students somehow. It was, you couldn't avoid it. So UMass is required. <laughs> So for UMass also it's required. I, I think probably there are a couple of reasons why it may not be documented. Uh, insurance for most graduate students is through um, the union. Mm -hmm. so that means they don't pay directly on an individual basis. So that might be one reason. It may, may not be documented. They might be shown as not having an insurance. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the other category is uh, even though all are required to have insurance, um, if a student coming from uh, or if a student is in a parent's insurance, mm -hmm. they can submit a waiver. And I'm not sure if those are counted towards this. If they mm -hmm. are waived, they may, may be shown as not, not having insurance. So the, it might be those cases. Mm -hmm. Possibly there's, I mean, there's such a high, I believe a high percentage of students that would be still on their parents. So I would be inclined to think they were counted, but it could also be students who are taking UMass's insurance and then graduating and still living in the area and not having their own insurance yet, but not having UMass's yet either. I think that could definitely be a possibility. Although until age 26, you can be on your parents' insurance if they have insurance, but that's I but don't. if your parents don't and you're taking UMass's and you graduate, right. what do you do? And it goes away. <laughs> That'll be interesting to find out. So yeah, one we could check with Musanti Health Center uh, what what they're seeing. Uh, mm -hmm. So one suggestion, I think the data is aggregated by everyone above 18 to all the way to 64. If it's some sort of a disaggregated by age groups, we might get a little bit more detailed information, you know, uh, how each, each age group is in distribution is respond, you know, is different from each other. You know. mm -hmm. It goes like very similar to the argument of age adjustment, but, um, but looking at demographics by age groups, uh, you know, uh, I think all the, all the things uh, you mentioned, all the data can be disaggregated by that. Anything else anyone wants to say, ask? Just once again, Bailey and Emily, it was a real um, joy working with you. Um, 
amazing students and Bailey, lots of luck in after graduation, you'll have your master's and we're very fortunate that we will still have Emily with us over the summer and next year. And I'm gonna be um, working as her preceptor so that she can get um, course requirements done for, for parts of these projects too. Um, and um, through the School of Public Health, you need a preceptor at the agency and because Jen already has so many hats filled. I'll be the preceptor for her. So thank you. Any other comments? Well, thank you all very much. And we'll move on to our next piece of business, which is the um, Center East Way um, uh, subdivision. Oh, you know what we forgot? the minutes from our last meeting. Uh, ah. So <laughs> before we go on, can um, we move back to the minutes, review and receive the minutes? I don't know how I missed that. It's in my number two on the pile. I'm just gonna back up to do that. Um, so does anyone have any comments, corrections? Uh, or amendments to our minutes of April 21st. If there are none, may I have a motion to accept them as they are presented to us? You're muted. I'm muted? <laughs> and I, myself. Uh, yeah, I will make a motion to accept the minutes uh, as written okay. for yes. April 21st. I'll second that. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded to accept our April 21st minutes. Um, and now I need a vote. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? So I, was, I wasn't able to, um, to read over the minutes, but is it possible to, you know, say something like um, if there's anything that needs to be added at this time you, ha you have to either you can abstain or you can say in favor or or not awesome. okay. and nancy um i uh, yes so it's been moved seconded and three of us have voted to accept them okay Sorry about that little snafu. Um, so now we'll go back to old business and the center um, East Way subdivision. And we have material in our packet from that. The, uh, uh, we wrote a letter to the planning board and we have Christine here and we have a response from um, Tom Reedy. There were some new documents that uh, were emailed to me this afternoon that I forwarded on right before the meeting. I don't know if that's pertinent tonight. No, oh, I didn't see those. Just, uh, they came in just before the meeting. Yeah, and I didn't see them either. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, here we go. Definitive plan. Ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tim, can you see them? <laughs> uh, yes, I just received those two documents. Yeah, I, I just opened them up. Mm. Is it possible to share it on a screen? If on the screen or if we just receive them? I, Jen, can you share them? But um, I don't let's see. Christine, perhaps I can, if I make you co-host, you can share them as an advance. Are they needed? 
I am. I'm not sure that they're needed, and I'm I, hopefully I, incompetent at sharing my screen. Yeah. But if someone needed to share a screen, either Mr. Reedy or Mr. Robleski might be able to do that. But the reason I forwarded them to you, I wasn't aware that they hadn't been forwarded um, previously, and I thought you should have them as part of your documentation. Um, Mr. Uh, Robleski took some of your comments and um, some of the planning board's comments and has revised the definitive subdivision plans. So one of the things you'll notice is that the sanitary sewer has been increased in size from six inches to eight inches. And that was one of the things that you requested that he um, do. Um, I'm not sure if the subdivision plans have changed in other ways related to your comments, but I know Mr. Reedy has answers to um, your questions and comments. So he should probably speak at some point. The other things that I forwarded to you were um, the stormwater report that we did receive. So um, the stormwater report relates to the existing undeveloped land on the property and the um, roadway that will that would be constructed if this subdivision were to be constructed. So that has all the information that you need as far as stormwater calculations, but I'm not sure that you want to get into reviewing that, but um, you do have the document now and it's been um, submitted by a, a registered professional engineer. And the other thing that um, I sent you was the soil data. And um, again, Mr. Reedy may have some comments that he wants to make about that soil data, but at least you have it now mm -hmm. um, as part of your records. And um, I know Mr. Uh, Rendier had, um, you know, commented on the fact that we didn't have that. And so now, now you have that. Um, so I really don't have any more to say. Um, and I will um, be happy to hear what Mr. Reedy has to say. And then if I need to answer questions, I'd be happy to do that. So with that, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy to take over if you don't mind. Okay, yes. Perfect, okay. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of Mr. Robleski and his uh, definitive subdivision plan, Mr. Robleski, Mr. Robleski is here with me this evening. Um, yeah, and, and so those plans, and I agree with Ms. Brestrup, I don't think, I think they're good for your packet, but I don't necessarily think that they're germane to this conversation. Um, we did, as Ms. Brestrup noted, update that uh, sewer line to eight inches based on the conversations. And then um, we also, as of last week, had sent over responses to your comments uh, that were provided in, in your review. And it might make sense for us to go through those 11 comments and responses. And then if you have additional questions, you know, we're happy to answer them. I'll take a step back and say, you know, we expect the town engineer to take a look at the stormwater information, the stormwater management report and the soil tests, um, and for him to confirm that what we've done is acceptable to the Massachusetts uh, DEP stormwater standards. So just so you understand a little bit about the process, there will be oversight and review. So that's one. And then two, we had a meeting with the planning board last night. The discussion with them was we've updated the plans you know, we'd ask for them to review it. I'm going to work with Ms. Brestrup to update what waivers we're asking for and what conditions are germane. And then ultimately it's in the court of the planning board to hopefully approve the subdivision with conditions uh, so that we're compliant with the subdivision rules and regulations, which, which we expect to. And for more context, when we had submitted the plan initially to the planning board, we had asked for a a slew of waivers, understanding that the, the plan was never to be built. After conversations with the planning board and conversations with this board, we had since updated the plans really to eliminate almost all, I think, of the waivers. And so it will be when it's back in front of the planning board for their final determination, um, a compliant, essentially a compliant plan. So just to talk to you about the process a little bit. So that all said, you know, we appreciated the, the observations and, and questions. Um, hopefully you had the opportunity. I did not have a Word document, so I wasn't able to you know, italicize underneath. So I, we may have to uh, flip back and forth or I can you know, speak um, about what the comment is and what our response is. And so uh, the first one 
really is, will the detention structure be able to handle all the, all the flows in the subdivision? And the answer is yes, the detention structure will be able to, able to handle all the flows from the road and undeveloped land. And then just to put a finer point on that, the individual lots. So hypothetically, again, if we were to construct this subdivision, the stormwater management proposed <laughs> would be able to handle the impervious surface that is being proposed as part of the subdivision. The point of the subdivision is to provide frontage for lots which wouldn't otherwise have frontage. Those lots would require as part of whatever approval to receive their building permit, they'd have to show that they have uh, stormwater management capacity and capability. So those individual lots would deal with that on a one-off basis, but the subdivision which creates the frontage is handled by what you have. Um, so that's number one. Number two, there was a discussion about, and I'm impressed with all of this, but discussion about the, the soils, um, the infiltrating nature of the soils, and then how to prevent contamination of the subsurface flows. And then our response is, so we're, we're providing a, a drainage system with catch basin, uh, treatment chamber like oil water separator, uh, drain piping and underground detention basin with an overflow connection that goes back to uh, the town catch basin and the town system, which has its own protective mechanisms. Um, the proprietary stormwater treatment infrastructure is called a storm scepter. Um, they're used, I mean, I so I do permitting all across the state. Cumberland Farms is a client of mine, as well as other gas stations and convenience stores. Um, Cumberland Farms uses a storm scepter. And as you can imagine, they're probably a much more highly intensive use than what we're looking to propose here. They use it to, for oil water separator, uh, to, to reach the total suspended solid numbers that they need to do under mass DEP. So that's what uh, Mr. Robleski is proposing here is a, a storm, storm scepter pretreatment. So we don't expect any contamination from surface uh, into groundwater, which is what I anticipate, what I at least understood that question to be. Ms. Brustrup, I'll, I'll stop because I see your hand. May I make a comment? Yes. I just wanted to note that the storm scepter is before the water gets to the infiltration basin. So it um, takes out the, um, the material that you wouldn't want to get inf infiltrated into the groundwater before the water gets to the uh, detention basin. Thank you. That's Thank a great you. point. I see Lauren and, and Mr. Robleski as well with hands, so. Stay quiet. Lauren. Thank you. Um, I, I was trying to do my homework and look over the um, the uh, forms and the information. And so I basically just want to, to know uh, about two things. Um, from what I read, um, the, the zoning is a, it's in the business district and it's non-residential. And I know there's going to be some construction. And so I just want to know what we as the Board of Health, what we need to do and um, exactly what we need to know and what, what exactly are the lots for? That would that's just a curiosity of mine. Sure, so if, if I could respond, um, and this is where it's a little bit of a mental exercise to understand the, the lots being proposed, while they're real lots, uh, it's a fiction. And what I mean by that is uh, Mr. Robleski does not intend to build uh, individual units of any kind, whether it be residential, uh, whether which are allowed, whether it's commercial, on those individual units. And in fact, um, he has already received approval and has built. So if you look at from the, the, the front page of your Board of Health review, you see a new building all the way on the east side. Uh, Mr. Robleski has recently built that. It's a mixed use building. So it's a mixture of commercial space and apartments. And there is on the balance of the site, an additional mixed use building. And he has just proposed to the planning board to build a third mixed use building on the site. And to be clear, these um, structures do not 
simply exist in those lots that we are creating. This whole exercise of creating these lots was simply to freeze the zoning so that, um, and I'll back up and say that the town of Amherst has recently passed revisions to their mixed use zoning bylaw, which requires 30% uh, of the first floor, or, or it could be an, another floor, floor area. Um, and while we can appreciate that as uh, an appropriate percentage for the downtown, being where Mr. Robleski's property is, and really the lack of foot traffic for commercial uses, uh, it seemed like 30% was much too much. And so the only way that he could preserve the old bylaw was to go through the, is to go through this process. And so that's really the context of, of why we're going through it. Um, so to answer your question, <laughs> nothing will be built on those individual lots um, because there's already existing structures on the land and there would hopefully if the planning board approves it be another structure on the land, but not specifically in those lots. And hopefully I haven't confused too much. No, so this is an exercise Correct. to to preserve the prior zoning rather than the new zoning. As it relates specifically to the mixed to, use yes. requirement of the 30% commercial in the structure or development. Yes. Mr. Robleski has his hand raised. Right. Would yeah. you like to speak? Yep. <laughs> Just shortly. Now, thank you, board members, for all your time. I certainly appreciate it. And I certainly realize that this is an exercise as Tom just described. But I just wanted to comment on number two regarding the detention areas. When those are designed, they have stone, like three quarter inch stone or one inch stone all the way around them, including the bottom. So the railroad, you know, it, that gives it some capacity to move a little bit and absorb any shocks and stuff, but it adds further filtration. And the bottom of that stone is above the estimated seasonal high water mark. So water coming in from a big storm or something, I don't think it's gonna affect it. There's probably a foot to 18 inches of stone below the uh, structures that are within that detention area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, Tim, so do you have any questions on that? Uh, I mean, uh, let let uh, Tom finish it, you know. Okay. Maybe I, because it looks like many of the responses are coming back to the first one, I think. Mm -hmm. And if we need Tom to talk about that more yes. comprehensively, cert we certainly can. Um, so yeah, number three, which uh, for, candidly is a new one to me, but I certainly appreciate it, is the uh, corrosivity of the soil. Um, and it's something you know we'll be sensitive to during material selection. You know, I think it's it's probably as simple as that. Um, number four it takes into consideration the slope and draining toward the cul-de-sac and the rail track. And will the design account for this accumulation? And the answer is yes. And then I refer to one because of the whole drainage system. Um, number five is about EJ, uh, which you know we're obviously because it, it is a new. Uh, I don't want to say new concept, but it's being newly implemented as far as uh, regulatory. And so it's something that, you know, we've obviously acknowledged. Um, I don't know that there is anything jurisdictional with the Board of Health, but it's something that, you know, especially hearing the previous presentation and, and wondering the interaction between the data and, and environmental justice. Um, but it's something that, you know, we certainly take into consideration. Uh, six is uh, impervious cover um, if the three lots are developed. And so that's another one where each individual lot will have to meet its stormwater standards. And yes, each lot would have a stormwater plan submitted. And I believe that's a proposed condition by the planning board, which is you know fine by the applicant. Um, underground detention basin. So for number seven, uh, there was a question about it. There was a setback from the railway. Um, and there is no required setback from the railway as there's probably best management practices, best design practices, but there's no required setback from that railway for that underground infrastructure. Um, and then, uh, as we've mentioned, and as you have now in your packet, soil testing is required to make sure that 
the soil can handle what we're uh, expecting it to handle. Um, number eight is the relative to the rules and regulations of the planning board. And um, we do comply uh, with what the rules and regulations say. And I, Ms. Bresco can probably expand on that one a little bit more if you'd like her to. You want me to answer that? Good by me. Yes. Um, so the um, uh, dimension that is referred to of 39 uh, point something, um, that refers to a minor road and the 49 point something refers to um, a major road. So depending on what kind of road you're designing, I think this is on page 23 of the, um, of the planning board rules and regulations governing the subdivision of land, 22 and 23. Um, there is a picture of a cul-de-sac that's given as an example, and it shows that the right of way is 49.212 feet wide. But if you go to the standards that are in the table on the opposite page, it shows that for a minor road, um, the right of way can be 39.370 feet wide. So um, it's just a question of whether we're gonna consider this a major road or a minor road. And, and I think it's being designed as a minor road. So that's why it can be 39 feet rather than the 49 feet. John, do you want to expand on that? You're muted. Uh, can you unmute? Yeah. Just to comment on that in that chart that Ms. Bestrup just re referred to, uh, as see note one, and note one is says to be determined by board at the review of the preliminary plan. <clears throat> so that's already been reviewed by the planning board and approved as a minor mm -hmm. road. Thank you. And then I guess I'll, I'll carry on to, yep. to number nine, which is uh, drainage needs to account for upstream properties and roads as is accounted for in the calculation. Uh, my simple answer is, you know, on a, I guess a technical level, no, because DEP requires only on-site stormwater considerations. And I guess my more long-winded answer or, or practical answer is if, if water is traveling over a site, it's from another property, it's probably, it's going to be taken into consideration. So while we don't do necessarily a watershed analysis of all the surrounding property and we stick to on site, um, there is necessarily some consideration of how that water gets on site. Um, and then 10 is sidewalk or biking provisions um, that uh, uh, sidewalk or biking is missing on Main Street. And so then what we've said is just Main Street, that area is a, is a public right away outside of the subdivision jurisdiction. And then there's a comment about Grant Street, which I, I believe to be Gray Street, um, which talks about having parking on both sides. And it's our belief that parking is only on one side of Gray Street, A, and then B, that's outside of the, the subdivision. And so I don't need to run through them so quickly, um, but those are our responses to, to the Board of Health's comments. Thank you. Tim, do you have any questions? Oh, um, thank you for or writing comments? the detailed comments. I think I agree uh, if, if there is an engineering oversight on the design itself, because that, those are the, all the questions are related to that oversight. I, I think if those are going to be incorporated, I think it will be perfectly fine. Uh, especially the corrosivity in the materials, uh, which was not uh, specified, but if, if the engineering oversight will take care of it, it will, it will be addressed that month. Uh, same thing with the uh, structure of the detention basin. Looks like the detention basin is designed for just the impervious, current impervious cover, right? the cul-de-sac and everything. So that means uh, I am assuming that um, if the three proposed lots are going to be developed, there'll be other best management practices going to be proposed and uh, and they will be reviewed and approved. So, I mean, so that answers majority of the 
uh, questions there. Uh, uh, one thing about seven, you mentioned about um, the frontage to the railways, you know, especially compaction, um, uh, integrity of the basin itself. Uh, so think something to think about in terms of the BMPs. I think you mentioned BMPs. So some some buffer uh, in terms of the impact of railway itself, the the uh, the, na the nature of how the long term sustainability of the structure will be impacted. So I mean any anything that could be added to that, it will be wonderful. Um, related to the question number eight, uh, I agree it was actually uh, approved as a minor minor road, uh, which that means 39.37 is, is perfect. So, but uh, my question is, is, will it be sufficient for any type of large vehicles to turn around? Uh, like say, for example, for uh, any type of a uh, uh, garbage truck or, or even fire truck accessing their property. John, have you talked to the fire department about that? Your can you unmute? Yeah. John, can you unmute Mr. Robles? Yeah, yep, yep, my okay. bad. I believe the fire department did respond to the planning department. Yes. But typically, we do have a, do have a yeah, document I mean, from the fire department. Yeah, to further, you know, standing from a public safety point of view and realizing what you're asking. Uh, if there is a any kind of structure fire on any one of those lots, my guess is there'd be parking at the end of the road, tying into the hydrant at Main Street. And there's also a hydrant on the corner of Gray Street, plus the hydrant that we would install at the cul-de-sac. So I think firefighting wise, public safety wise, they wouldn't be driving in there. And as far as other big vehicles, um, my guess is this, cul-de-sac is pretty close to the cul-de-sac at Triangle and East Pleasant as far as width. Uh, I haven't measured it, but, you know, that's pretty tight. I was there yesterday, parked down the street, and I could see a flatbed tractor trailer, and their wheels went up over the inside curbing. Uh, you're talking uh, about the roundabout there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, but I did want to comment on the uh, BMPs, Mr. Randy here. Um, I did add a uh, rain garden at the bottom of the cul-de-sac island, and that also has a uh, catch basin in it that would drain any overflow. It's an overflow catch basin over to the, uh, the drain system. So I understand the BMPs. I use that on another project, rain gardens, LID development and all, and, and I like that. Any other questions or comments? One one last question. I, I think the question number nine. Uh, I agree that current rules uh, by DEP does not need to be accounting for upstream runoff. But uh, I think I encourage any type of a new uh, site developments in the three sites should some sort of a account if there is going to be runoff from the road or any place you know upstream of it because uh, the slope is actually coming from the road itself the gray street and towards the rail uh, to just to account and see if there is a need for a upstream rain garden to be included uh, not just the on-site runoff but but that is just a request as a in, in general it it, it may not be a part of the statute itself, but, but it's just something a landowner should consider. I think they did consider that. I didn't look through the entire stormwater thing, but there's a graph in there that I believe takes into account some of the properties to the north that you know flow down that direction. And Gray Street has curbings along it, so nothing is going to overflow there. It's going to channel into the catch basins along Gray Street. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? If not, are we ready to move forward and vote? So what you are asking 
us to do is to approve the Center East Way definitive subdivision, which will probably not be built. <laughs> yes. Is that correct? That is that is correct. <laughs> okay. So may I have a motion to accept the Center East Way definitive subdivision? I'll make the motion. I accept the Center East Way definitive subdivision as presented with the changes um, with uh, the planning board will have all the oversight on this. I second it. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Um, all in favor, uh, we'll have a vote. Uh, all in favor, Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. So it's been moved, seconded, and approved um, for the Center East Waste Definitive Subdivision. So thank you thank all. Thank you very much for all your time. Really <laughs> yes. Thank you again. I understand. I served on a committee in the town I live in, and I understand your devotion to the town of Amherst. And spending the time to, to do what you do. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. May I ask a question? Yes. I wonder, um, I received a letter from Jennifer, um, I think it was about a week ago and it was based on the um, meeting that was held in April. And I wonder if you're planning to issue a, another letter um, stating what this vote was or if that's the letter that I should pass on to the planning board. And um, the other thing is I would then um, give the planning board the Board of Health review that was provided by Tim and the answers that were provided by Tom Reedy. Is that how you would like this to work or were you planning to um, give me another letter um, about tonight's meeting? Do we need a letter or can you just use our vote? Or do we need a formal letter saying that we voted in favor of the subdivision? Well, Jennifer had written a letter and it was sent to me about a week ago, maybe. Um, and so Jennifer, I don't know if you were planning to write another letter capturing this discussion or if the letter that you sent before is something I should send to the planning board or if we shouldn't send that letter and I should just tell the planning board myself that you voted tonight and then um, perhaps provide them with Tim's analysis and Tom's um, answers. From my perspective, it's, I mean, Board of Health provides the recommendation to the, the plan, their recommendation to the planning board. So it could be as simple as, I don't wanna put more work on Jennifer's plate, but just either a letter saying, on the May 5th, 2022 meeting, the Board of Health unanimously voted to recommend approval of the uh, definitive subdivision plan. Um, or Chris, you can just take, you know, Jennifer could even do an email if she wanted and just send it along and say, here's what happened. And then whatever material you wanna give the planning board based upon discussion, um, I mean, obviously you can do that. Would so, it help if I took that off Jennifer's plate and if I wrote the letter and copied Jennifer and attached Tim's analysis and Tom's answers, would that help? Yeah. If, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. Uh, send it to me. For I'd like to have something for our records. Yeah. Um, so I think and, yours, yours would be yeah. inclusive, yeah. And something for the records for the uh, planning board, so. All right, so I'll, I'll draft that letter and I'll send it to Jennifer with the attachments. Okay. Chris, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I, we have new business now, um, but I also see that uh, Anne Devlin Gauthier, who is a 
town councilor. It's a topic not anticipated by the chair, but she has a meeting at 630. So I'm just going to move this up to here um, quickly. And this is uh, regarding the bylaw um, prohibiting deceptive advertisement by crisis pregnancy centers. And it is a bylaw that the town council is um, considering its deceptive advertising. And um, it was my thought that it would be helpful if the Board of Health um, sends a letter in support of this bylaw. So Anna, can we Hi. There we go. Um, can you just address this quickly and then we'll. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Nancy, for the invitation and hello, love the board. Um, I apologize for the last minute notice of this and I am so grateful for Nancy for reaching out. So here's the quick overview. I um, introduced a bylaw on April 28th, I believe, um, which is intended to uh, to prevent deceptive advertising on behalf of limited services pregnancy crisis centers or CPCs for short. So CPCs are um, organizations that seek to intercept pregnant, pregnant individuals who might be considering an abortion. Uh, their mission is to prevent abortions by persuading pregnant people that adoption or parenting is a better option. They often give the impression that they are clinical centers offering legitimate medical services and advice, yet they are exempt from regulatory licensure and credit credentialing oversight that apply to healthcare facilities. So they, they engage in counseling that is misleading and false. Um, despite claims to the contrary, they do not meet standard of patient-centered quality me medical care. Uh, they are known for those billboards that say like pregnant, we can help, pregnant and scared, we can help, right? Um, they advertise specific types of counseling and medical care that they do not offer. So um, other ways that they engage in deceptive advertising, they uh, claim to advertise free pregnancy tests, STD testing, confidential counseling, um, and some clinics don't actually offer it. They advertise it and they don't offer it. They say negative things about abortion, birth control, condoms, or sex, including false claims about the legality of abortions and false claims about the safety um, of abortion, uh, abortion care. They say, some of them often say it leads to cancer, infertility, or mental health problems. None of that is true. Um, and they often post signs near uh, real health centers like Planned Parenthoods um, or near us like Tapestry. Um, and they've even been known to use similar branding or colors. So a lot of what they engage in is deceptive advertising. Um, so what this bylaw would do, it, it does not limit CPCs from existing. What it does prevent or what it does provide is an avenue for folks to um, report false advertising on behalf of these pregnancy crisis centers. Uh, and they would be faced with a $300 fine, which is what we are allowed to find based on state law. Um, that's the very, very brief overview. Um, I'm very happy to give any further questions um, or answer any further questions that you might have about this bylaw um, and its intention and its process. Just so you know, the council referred it to our governance uh, committee in April and they are reviewing it this Wednesday. It then goes back to the council uh, for two readings uh, starting at our next meeting. <laughs> Um, I hope that was, I know that was a blazing fast overview, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I, I think this time might be better used in, in conversation than me talking at you. So I'm happy to hear anything you might, any questions you might have. And I would be honored if you would uh, write a letter and support that would, it would mean a lot. And I appreciate that. If you really, if you decide to. does anyone have any questions for Anna? Uh, how how many of these centers are in Amherst and how much of the advertising is in Amherst and would the advertising for something say in Hadley or Northampton also be covered under this bylaw? So the way that I wrote the first off, there are 29 of these in the state. 
Amherst does not currently have any CPCs in town. One did try to establish here, I believe it was maybe five years ago. Jennifer might know better than I do, but one did try to establish here in the past and was run out of town by our students. Um, for, that's, that's what I hear. I'm sure that's there's a more official way of saying that. Um, so while there are none currently located in Amherst, there are uh, some located around us. East Hampton has one, I believe Greenfield might, um, Holyoke Springfield do as well. So this would limit them from advertising in Amherst. There are questions about regulatory. Um, there are separate laws governing their ability to advertise on places like Facebook. And we're, we're ensuring that this bylaw, which does cover the internet, um, is able to be followed through uh, upon for, for advertising that is online, but it would limit centers outside of Amherst from coming in and advertising here. They also have mobile clinics, mobile CPCs um, that could come through without necessarily establishing a business here. Um, and so that those would also be limited from advertising in Amherst. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Maureen? Absolutely. Okay. okay. <laughs> Tim or Lauren, do you have any questions? Uh, so one quick question. Yeah. Um, so much of this bylaw is, is, is based on the premise that it is deceptive advertisement. Um, and was there any type of studies or any type of quantification of it or because we have advertisements are always deceptive most of the time for everything so i'm just curious uh, how uh, how it is quantified and what 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 is some sort of a motivation to only focus on this particular organization sure so the reason why i'm going to i'm going to go backwards with your question so the reason why i'm focusing on these is that they are not um, typically covered by our state's general deceptive advertising law because they uh, what they claim is that they are not selling a product. Um, and so that's how they tend to get through the, the loopholes. Um, I'm happy to send along some studies that uh, I have found, including a really great article from the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics that specifically mm -hmm. talks about the propagation, quote, their propagation of misinformation should be regarded as an ethical violation that undermines women's health. Um, I mean, there have been studies on this both on the federal level and uh, both by the federal government and by the um, some of these researchers from the AMA. Um, so this is this is known, but they typically are not um, they are typically not caught under that umbrella of state and federal deceptive practices laws because they claim they are not selling a product. What, your other question? I apologize. What was your other question? Oh, just a quantification. You know, is there was there any study about that, or was I think you mentioned the publications, right? Yes, yeah. This. So, and I'm happy to pass those along to Nancy to for, to send to you all. Um, uh, I can send the the few articles I found that have been the most helpful, but um, the the information is readily available on how these are uh, deceptive and and how they've managed to get around existing law. Yeah. And is this bylaw is only proposed for Amherst? Correct. And not That's for all others. Let me have jurisdiction over right now. <laughs> right. So, I'm just I'm just curious about other towns, you know, in the Pioneer Valley. Oh yeah. So I can answer that. Yeah. So Somerville recently passed one that's very similar, um, and I've been speaking with some colleagues in Northampton and East Hampton from their city councils on passing them in their areas. Um, I believe I I see some some intrepid uh, reporters in the audience, and so I want to note that this. Don't quote me on this, but I believe that there is. Um, there are some folks at the state level who are hoping to introduce this legislation on the state level. It has been introduced in Connecticut as well on the state level. So um, yes, we are not we are not alone in doing this. Any other questions, Lauren? Lauren? Lauren, can you speak? If I'm unmuted, but I guess you can't hear me. No, oh, we, we can. can. We can. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, I was just going to say. Uh, Wait a minute. We can't hear you. We lost you. Lauren, we can't hear you.
Lauren, you're muted. Can you unmute? Okay, Lauren is muted. No. Okay, Lauren, are you there? <clears throat> Yeah, yes, I'm here, but you're having a problem hearing me. So now I can hear it. you. You oh. were muted for a minute. Okay. No, I, I was unmuted, but anyway, I just if you can hear me now without so. being cut off. Yes, I I just wanted to thank Anna for bringing this to our attention. But um, I have never seen any of these, you know, billboards because I guess you said that there's none in in Amherst right now. So. I was just wondering what was what initiated this for you, or what what was the initiation to put this together, this bylaw together? Sure. So, um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So first off, okay. it's not just it's not just billboards, right? So it's any print or online advertising. The billboards are usually just the example that people can have have seen before. Um, so this would limit folks from you know buying an ad in the Gazette or something like that as well. Um, what prompted this for me, you know, this has been, I mean, how deep into my story do you want to go, Lauren? Uh, so the, <laughs> this is something that's been on my radar since I was in college and first learned about these CPCs. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I went to school um, outside of Massachusetts in an area where they're, they're much more common. Um, and I, I think that ever since then, it's just been on my mind of like, that's, that's not right. You know, like, that's not, how can they do this? It's not right. Just personally, ethically, that's how I felt. Um, and as I learned a little bit more about it, uh, I, that feeling deepened and became more of uh, more informed on fact than just my gut feeling. Um, and then I learned about the, the idea of doing local legislation when a city councilor in Somerville introduced and passed it there. And so I spoke with her about her process. Um, I looked at their bylaw and, and wrote ours um, from there. So that's that was kind of the process is I saw other people um, engaging in this and kind of creating this this uh, this protective this this pr this protection for their towns. Um, and I thought it was something that reflected Amherst's belief beliefs, right? We have passed uh, resolutions in support of the Roe Act. We have stood very strongly in support of reproductive justice and this is something else that we can do and we should do. Um, the fight for, for reproductive justice, I mean, in the past week uh, has, has demonstrated that is, it's under extreme attack. And so um, in my mind, there, the local level doesn't have a lot um, that we can necessarily do in terms of policy, but this is something. And so, and I'm looking for the other things too, right? But this is something right now that we can do to support reproductive justice, um, even if it's not necessarily, you know, the the most dire need, um, we can we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can pass this and deal with the the other dire needs in town. And I've been aware of them in um, Holyoke and Springfield, and and the problems they have caused for, especially um, teenage girls. Yeah. Um, so Absolutely. board, do you feel educated enough that you we can vote on writing a letter of support for this um, bylaw? And if so, could I have a, a motion to accept it or if you want to postpone it for our next meeting? Although when when do you hope to get this passed through this town council? Uh, so GOL is the governance committee is reviewing it on Wednesday, the 11th. Um, it would be wonderful to have support by that point. Um, I understand that would mean tonight voting tonight. Um, our next council meeting is um, the uh, 16th, and then we don't have one again until uh, until the 6th. So, it, so we would I'm need to do. If you, if you don't feel like you have enough information yet, I am happy to give you more. I mean, I have a whole. A whole presentation. We would need to vote on it tonight. Otherwise, it would be great. Yeah. that would be great. Board, do you feel comfortable voting on this tonight? A letter of support um, for the bylaw about uh, crisis pregnancy uh, centers and deceptive advertising. 
I think the letter of support um, is perfectly I've... fine, I think. Okay. Yeah. Would you yeah, like to make I a agree. motion? I agree. This is on my radar for a long time, and I, I, I would support this letter. Okay. You want to make a, either of you want to make a motion to support writing a letter um, supporting the bylaw prohibiting deceptive advertising of uh, CPCs? I'll do that. I'll see if I can say it right. Uh, <laughs> I would propose that we write a letter in support of the bylaw proposed um, for the town council that would limit ad advertising by CPCs or what is it's like pregnancy crisis pregnancy, crisis pregnancy centers um, in Amherst. Tim, do you want to second it? I will second it. Uh, only, only one correction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you didn't mention about deceptive advertisement, right? It's specifically just, deceptive advertising, not yeah. all advertising. Not all advertising, not all advertising. deceptive advertising, yeah. Yes. Well, and, correct. So the motion is to support the bylaw prohibiting deceptive advertising by crisis pregnancy centers um, in Amherst. Can we add with a letter? Because that's how we're supporting it. Yes, that's what yeah. the motion a letter. is. To write a letter, oh, yeah. I, oh, I, I know. I, I just didn't hear that. Yes. The motion. Okay, so seconded, that's yeah. the motion. It's been seconded. Um, all in uh, uh, call for a vote. Lauren? Sure. Please. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay, Anna, and I'll be in touch with you for thank writing the letter and we'll get the letter written. Okay. And thank you for all your work. That presentation was beautiful. So thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you everybody for moving that up to there. Now we're gonna do the Green Meadow Pool with Susan Malone and we have all the documents were forwarded to us about this with the letter from April 27th and the swimming pool inspection report and the photos. And we, we have two people that are, are joining us, Sharon Callahan King and Alberta Morales. Okay. Susan, do you want to give an introduction? Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Yes. Thank um, you. So, um, we normally do our routine pool inspections beginning in late May, but um, El Beltro Morales, who is the certified pool operator for Green Meadow, contacted me. He had concerns about um, the pool fencing and uh, some safety concerns. So he asked me to come out and do an inspection and I did. And so the two important things that came out of this um, and I'll, I'll do the kind of the lesser one first. Um, pools built prior to October 2nd, 1975 are required to have four foot fencing around the pool. And uh, due to the, um, briefly, I'm just gonna say due to circumstances, that is no longer the case. That was my observation that, that it no longer meets the standard and the of, of that and needs to be replaced if the pool is to be reopened. It now must meet standards the same as pools constructed after October 2nd, 1975. And, and that's either a uh, six foot chain link or five foot stockade fence. So that all will take effect. Um, if and when the association decides to reopen the pool, which usually they do in late May or in June. Um, the other observation I had at that time is related, um, but it's of a more emergency nature. The pool had been uh, previously surrounded by a dense, tall, thick, bush and shrubberies. You can see a lot of that in some of the pictures. Um, and on the, let's see, it's the it, one side of the pool that 
um, provide, and it provided somewhat of a protection because not only was there at the time um, fencing, but uh, this additional dense, tall shrubbery also was a deterrent for approaching the pool. On the south side of the pool and fencing, uh, it's been substantially removed. And additionally, there is planking that was placed down. The planking really has to do with, it's kind of a pathway to the um, uh, electrical utility out there. They were doing some work and there's a picture uh -huh. there that shows the planks and in the background you can see the electrical tower and wiring. So that, it, it's very high, it's about measured approximately eight inches and that reduced the effective height of the fencing. So basically even my old body could hoist itself right over that fence and get right into the pool area. Um, which is a danger not only because it is a fill, filled pool, but also the um, tarp covering the pool, the pool cover, uh, or any pool cover over an in-ground pool is a hazard because if you just were to step onto that, you would sink down into the pool and become entrapped into the tarp. So um, the emergency order was um, to present a plan to remedy that um, situation. And a very short timeline was given because it is an emergency. The, um, so we have two parts of this order, the um, replacement of pool fencing in its entirety is dependent on reopening the pool, but there is this emergency component, which we would like them to have a plan present, you know, ready to go by May 6th and to be implemented by May 9th. And uh, uh, both Alberto and also the president of the Green Meadow Association, uh, Sharon King are here uh, so they can be heard on, on their concerns and questions. And I've already said to them and to Jen, if the board determines that more time is needed or um, uh, a better description of a plan is needed, I'm perfectly amenable to whatever the board's um, best judgment is on how to resolve the emergency situation. So with that, I would say, Jen, we could let Alberto and Sharon. I just have one question, Susan. So this planking, is this the planking that, that's going down all over Amherst mm -hmm. because they're replacing those towers and it will be taken up or is this permanent planking? That's so I, ha I have not been in contact with them. If you go, if you're on the road of um, West Pomeroy, um, I think it's West Pomeroy Lane that, um, and, and it's, um, sorry, I, I'm, I don't know if it's West Pomeroy Lane or Pomeroy Lane at that time. Just Pomeroy. Pomeroy. Yeah. Pomeroy. So, Pomeroy. so yeah, I have not been in touch, but there's signage um, and uh, I, I don't know how long that planking is going to be there if it's, um, a short term. Uh, so I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question. Okay. Well, I can Sharon, okay. jump in. <laughs> yeah, um, say Sharon or Alberto, if you'd like to speak. This planking went down. We met with Eversource, Eversource. Um, oh, two years ago. And they told us that they were going to be replacing the high tension wires and the towers and that there would be a small road that ran through the right of way and that um, it would not impact the pool, which they didn't, they were supposed to start last year, but they held off till after the pool season. So that was great. But then they started in um, about, I think, October, and 
put this planking down and it is just covering like 20 feet or more from Pomeroy Lane all the way down to Potwine Lane and then all the way up to Shea Street and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it goes up a Bay Street. I've, I've, I've seen it all over the place. That's right. why I missed. Right, because they're replacing the tower, uh, the, those green towers mm -hmm. with big solid uh, iron like pillars. Mm -hmm. And so I came home on um, 1210 and Alberto called me and we went out to the area of the pool and they had taken a brush cutter and just cut the hedge down. Didn't ask anybody, didn't notify us that it was gonna happen, nothing. Just tore it down all the way to the fencing. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a letter to Eversource, said, what have you done? How are you gonna fix it? When are you gonna fix it? You know, this is the Green Meadows only asset really is the pool and we have to pay membership dues. But without this asset, people aren't gonna to wanna to pay the dues. And we have covenants on our deeds. And so this is a real mess. So I was reassured by Tyler Donnelly who works for Watkins Strategies that they would uh, replace the entire fence, uh, the enclosure, mm -hmm. but said that they couldn't do it right away. And there was an anticipation that they would fix the area that's so easily accessible, but they have not. So I've been back in touch with Tyler and <clears throat> I sent him the information uh, that Ms. Malone sent to the Green Meadow Association. And he has responded that uh, they are perfectly willing to repair all of the fencing, but that it is not gonna happen immediately. They, I also sent them in the most recent letter, um, a request that they put in temporary fencing until such time as they can do the entire restoration of the whole pool house area. And he has um, agreed to look into that. They've sent that to their construction team and they are to be coming back with a plan. However, they want to meet with me and Alberto on the 11th, which is Wednesday. So um, at that time, they will lay out their plan for the um, replacement of the temporary fencing. I've offered to meet on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, any of those times to expedite this. I have not heard back from them, but they have been fairly responsive to this. But in the short term, you know, we need to have them help us out to fix what their subcontractors have done so that we're not put in a libel situation for someone entering the pool. So that is what the immediate plan is. And I think that's about as good as we can do on short notice is to meet with them either Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday and then have them fix the, I suggested that they fix the temporary fencing like today. Uh, they didn't, of course, respond to that, but that was what I asked them to do. It's a tough, tough situation. It's a terrible situation. It's horrifying. N not to mention the fact that they have totally destroyed all of this 60 years of trees and, you know, they've taken out so many trees and you know, 
uh, evergreens. It, it just looks like a wasteland back there. Mm. And these are people's backyards. And, you know, they never really indicated that this was going to be the case. Susan, can you give us some guidance? Um, sure. Um, I think that as long as they, Sharon's able to obtain a meeting date um, on one of those days, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and that um, out of that meeting comes a plan for some type of temporary fencing or barrier or protection, and that that will happen within a reasonable time. Um, I'm suggesting a week, um, but I, I'm certainly uh, will. I, I feel like anything that sounds reasonable and practical to be able to put some protection in place as soon as possible, but we all have to go through a process of meeting and getting a plan and, and um, they have to get workmen out there. Um, I came up with my original deadlines because it seemed foolish for me to say this was an emergency and say, now you have a month to address it. So, um, but knowing that Sharon, you, you've been working on this um, and Alberto has been working on this and you're the ones who brought it to my attention. So that's um, Nancy, what I, I see if they can uh, make that meeting happen and um, they're working on a time frame. So uh, you would like us to vote to give you the ability to extend the deadline? That... Yes, or, or, or the, the board itself can actually extend the deadline. Okay. I have no problem with that. We don't need to add more paperwork if you would like to extend the deadline. That's okay. great. Okay. So do we do you want a, a a date on that or say a two week? Sharon, what do you feel like is going to be workable? Well, you know, this is sort of like pushing a rock up a hill trying to get Eversource to do anything <laughs> that they don't want to do. But um I feel like they've grasped the urgency of it because not only are we asking for them to fix the fence and do it temp for in a temporary way and then do it in a permanent way, but we're asking them for a financial um, uh, amount of money to make up for the people who live here and have had to put up with this and you know that they have made our property really unsellable at this point so i think they get the urgency that it's not you know that we want the money but that we want to be whole again yeah i and i think the 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 urgency is more important because even though we want something that that's a reasonable barrier or protection, we're also not necessarily looking for them to put in fencing and then put in other fencing down the road. Uh, when I spoke with the um, uh, building inspector, they were saying, you know, maybe some of that the orange construction webbing, I'm not familiar with all of the mm -hmm. proper names, but just getting something up there that deters people from from the right. access um if, yeah, so if, I, if the board agrees that okay. that's sufficient so you would like a motion um extending the date for having um the temporary and permanent pool fence um Tell me what you want in this motion. <laughs> <laughs> to, um, all right, so um, to, to, to extend the um, deadline for the, um, to remedy the safety hazard. That, that's the only part because the other oh, part okay. is going to, you know, when they open the pool, they just won't open the pool until they can get that fencing resolved. So oh, it's okay. the safety hazard portion. And um, 
I think that if we're talking about them meeting on the 9th, 10th or 11th, uh, I'd, I'd like to see something put in, up by um, the 14th. And um, you know, I, uh, even, yeah. I think also uh, Tyler's been pretty responsive, like answering questions and emails within hours. So I feel as though if I suggested to him that uh, the crew that's out there regularly, daily, put up the orange webbing, that they could maybe get that done before the weekend. Yeah. I, you know, that, that would seem reasonable. If they could do that, that would be great. And then we can hammer out the other details later. That, that sounds good to me. That gives them an, uh, you know, it's additional week. Right. Um, to do that. Okay. Would someone like to make that motion? I had a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Susan, you had mentioned that, that the TARP added to the risk involved in this. Is there anything you would recommend doing about that other than just really trying to get this fencing up sooner rather than yeah. later? Uh, I think some kind of um, emergency remedy is the most important thing right now. Um, okay. Because because let's face it, you know, up until this point, mostly it was a four foot fence, but now it's not even four feet. <laughs> you know, it's it's hardly over three mm -hmm. feet in effect. So, um, okay. we, we want to be okay. reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Warren, do you want to make a motion? Um, I'll make a motion that we extend the deadline for uh, emergency fencing to be placed around the Green Meadow Association swimming pool by May 14th. Is that, did I capture that? I'm not good at that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's uh, adequate. Susan, is that an okay date? That that sounds good to me. Okay, it, so it is still an emergency. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So we have the um, the motion for the date to be extended to May fourteenth for the uh, temporary fence until the permanent fence is put in place. May have a second. I second it. Okay. So voting Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Lauren. Aye. And Nancy, aye. Okay. So Sharon, I hope this moves fast for you. I do as well. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, talk with me later and let me know when you have a meeting set up. Okay, I should Thanks go so tomorrow. Much. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thanks everybody, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So much. Okay, now mosquito control. Um, I've been ta oh, go ahead. talking with Jen and although we discussed it and voted on it last summer, we did not join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Um, so, Jen, do you want to present the material on this? Yeah. So, so thanks, everybody. So, this is my understanding of what's going on with mosquitoes. So, I'm going to speak to you tonight about two separate issues, um, ask you to make a decision that they will then be moved up to the town council. I'm presenting to them on uh, mosquito, these two mosquito issues, on May 16th. Um, when I present to them, I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation, and I may be asking um, Christopher Craig from the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District to join me, who is an expert on this material. So yes, you guys voted on this last year. Um, the two things I want to talk to you about are joining the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, the PCMCD, and I'm going to talk about that. The second thing is to decide if 
Amherst wants to, if you want to recommend to vote out of spraying that would be conducted by the state. So that's the State Reclamation Con Mosquito Control Board. Um, so I want to um, say that I would recommend joining the Pine River Valley Mosquito Control District. Um, the cost is $5,000. That's something that the Board of uh, the Health Department has this year. Next year, who knows what we'll, we'll have, but we've had different funding, so we have enough to pay for it this year. Um, the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, um, if we join, we join um, many of our neighbors, um, and um, including Granby, Hadley, Holyoke, Northampton, Shutesbury, South Hadley, Sunderland. And what they are able to provide for us is um, certain services, and it's a la carte. We can choose what we want. Um, but what they do is sort of an integrated pest management approach, approach, an IPM, and they will look at water management, so catchment areas, if there's freestanding water, they can come in, assess, and help us um, manage that. Source reduction, again, that's looking at the habitat of different mosquitoes that carry West Nile or Triple E. They're able to do education and outreach for us. Um, if we need larval mosquito treatment or adult mosquito treatment. Um, they also provide, which I'm really would be excited about, is um, surveillance. So they'd be able to put in mosquito um, traps um, and they would be able to analyze, analyze the viral load and actually do mapping for us. The other thing that I think is key to partnering with them, becoming with them, is that they really do meet with the state reclamation board frequently, um, the Mass um, Department of Agriculture and DPH. They have a very open uh, communication with them. So that's something that I'd like you um, to consider. Um, I do recommend that. Um, I think that's something that you voted for doing last year. Well, should we do that and then move on to the second part? Or do you want to do both? Yeah, no, that's good. Keep it nice and clean. Yes. So what we are re-voting on is that we- I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I keep uh, doing it wrong. Yes. So um, when I read that some of the information you provided, and I realized that, that Amherst is considered now a high-risk area, it requires that the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District be, be demonstrably uh, pro proven to be able to perform comprehensive interventions, including adulticide applications and uh, both aerial and ground. And I just, I remember we received some information about that district, but I don't remember if that was true. So I just wonder if, if you've been able to find out that. Yeah, so my understanding, and, and thank you, that's a really good question. It was kind of gonna lead into that um, with a second part is, but at this point, the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District is not able to provide spraying. So no hopper on a truck, nothing on a helicopter or um, an airplane. So that's something in the future, but that that's not something um, that they offer. Okay. So it seems like our application for uh, this is the next part wouldn't uh, to be out of the state uh, program would be denied. Um, if I, I did that correctly. Yeah, I don't know if it would be denied. Um, the process to um, apply is much easier this year. Um, I've looked through the application, the checklist, and we really have a history of you know, robust education and outreach. Um, we have a lot of things, tools in our hand that we can do before we get to that point. Um, so I don't know if it would be denied. Um, we would make a strong argument, yeah. And we and, would now have testing um, and, and catch, catching mosquitoes to test them for. Um. No, I think it's a good idea to be a member, including like the ability to, to do surveillance and come in earlier with less intense 
measures um, and avoiding the high risk health risk be determined to be a um, health emergency, you know, so I think it's a good idea. I just wonder, it just from my reading, it seemed like unless, unless they have the ability to do that, they, we might not be approved in terms of our, our withdrawal from the state program, but Excuse me. We'll do what yeah. we can, right? <laughs> right, right. So I think I think you're right. These are two two. They're they're intertwined, but still, I think we're just yeah looking at that pioneer. Value. Yeah, I don't think it's a reason not to be part of that. I, I guess is, but no. I have concerns about what, how this is going to play out. Okay, Lauren. Um, Lauren. Um. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um. If we become part of the, uh, if Amherst becomes part of the PCMCD, are you, is it that we're not utilizing any of the state um, pest control um, uh, provisions or you know anything that the state would uh, provide? That's so I'm going to tell you, I don't have a really clear answer if that's something. Um, how it would overlap, you know, this, the state, um, the state reclamation C control board um, are, are working with these other con um, mosquito control districts. So they're all really communicating. I don't think they would say, hey, you know, you're on your own, we're not going to offer this. But I think it does come down to spraying. That's the thing that I, that we would be, we need to decide on separately. The last time I, I, I think you checked on the date, um, Jen, it was either 2009 or 2010 when EEE Triple E was rampant out um, in Western Massachusetts. And um, there was a lot of education going out and all um, sports uh, games were all canceled <laughs> after, uh, uh, before dusk came. So there were measures, uh, educational and measures taken in town when there was a rise in uh, the possibility of um, triple E. Yeah, so triple E goes in these cycles every 10 years, every seven years, and then it sticks around for like about three or four years. 2019 was really horrible. There were 12 cases of triple E and six, six deaths in the, uh, Massachusetts. Most of them were out in Bristol, um, Norfolk County. Um, <clears throat> 2020 um, was still a busy year um, with five cases of Tripoli. 2021, it was very quiet. So, you know, there's some people talking about, you know, where are we going to be in this cycle? And I'm going to tell you, I don't have that knowledge. Was the fall wet? Um, was there not a, a blanketing snow cover? What does that mean for this year? So I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And in the past, the, the greater number of cases and all were um, uh, southeastern Massachusetts. But we did have them in this area. Mm -hmm. um, we had them in Wentworth. Yeah, and we had them in Belchertown. Belchertown. That was 2012, I think. That was back then. That la the last, the previous cycle of Triple E was about 10, 2012. And that was like Belchertown and Granby. There was like a horse and there was yeah. a, yeah. I don't know, maybe Surveil two horses. Yeah. yeah. Surveillance but, starts in June. And I think last, um, or maybe it was in 2019, but they, they started getting Triple E mosquitoes in the area in July, so. And mm -hmm. what joining the Pioneer Valley, um, Mosquito Control District will allow us to do is having surveillance and having the uh, mosquitoes trapped and tested, correct? Yeah, it's kind of fun to see the traps. If you go down to Station Road at dusk, you can see them glowing off into the woods. You know, we have the habitat here in Amherst. We yeah. have hardwood, cedar, freshwater swamps. You know, park at Station Road and head to Belchertown. You can just see these mosquitoes, crypts, you know, so they're there. So, so do we uh, want to join? Any more questions? I just have a quick question. You mentioned that it's a cycle of 10 years. Like um, I, seven, seven, I think it's seven or eight years. And yeah. the idea is, I think, that it's, it's brought into the area by migrating birds. And then 
it'll then it gets into the mosquitoes and then there's a different kind of mosquito that bites both birds and mammals and and I think that the timing is that there are how many susceptible birds there are in the area. So they'll all get it. And then a new variety will come like seven years later and the birds are susceptible again, I think is how that, why, why there are these cycles. So, um, and then they might be active for two or three years and then fade out again. It, it's, I don't know. <laughs> It's interesting. It is interesting. I know this and, is and it's increasing. I, I think that's the other thing in, yeah. in the western, central western part of the state. It had yeah. been pretty much non-existent until yeah. more recent years. Um, if you go to Arbor Virus, you know, mass.gov, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the 2021 Massachusetts Arbovirus Surveillance and Response Plan. You can really read this very long document that's, that's very detailed and, um, and has information similar to what Maureen was talking about. Yeah, the, it seems, I mean, I, this, I, I don't know if we need to talk about this, but it seems like the legislature about two years ago decided that the old uh, regulations about mosquito control were formulated in 1918 and they hadn't real, really significantly revised <laughs> since then. And so there's a task force that's trying to bring this into the 21st century. And there will probably be some legislation that changes, but, um, and I think the goal is to use more scientific measures to have things be more uniform across the state in terms of when to come in with these heavier duty things. Cause I think in southeastern mass i think some of those control boards go too far you know and that they'll they'll spray for nuisance reasons and not just public health reasons so i think they're trying to get this up to date and and we're in a it's, it's part of this process there's like a 300 page report from the eastern research group about that that was commissioned by that task force that came out in april i looked at it but i can say I read it. <laughs> um, and there was a summary of the task force that was shorter, but also very detailed. Um, so it's, it's, I think we're in the process of trying to bring this, bring these um, measures forward and be more responsible in terms of environmental issues and health issues and having more input of the Board of Health onto the state reclamation and control board. So um, anyway. <laughs> that's great morning yeah that's what i did yesterday wow. <laughs> in the rain on a rainy day on a rainy day <clears throat> okay any more like, questions uh, yeah there are two yeah. aspects to it one is more scientific surveillance see where the thing you know where the um, cases are and that's where the mosquito control district comes into play and the second decision is primarily what if we have very high number of cases occurring what do we do about it you know so these are two different ones i, I think right of so course the does. mosquito control district one is perfectly fine because right. that it provides a lot of intelligence uh, about you know data set collection and all sorts of things you know but if we hit a you know like a case load which is going to be rising up and what do we do about it you know so right. Those are two different things. Right. And that's why we're going to have two separate votes. Yeah. So the first vote, if anyone, no one has any more questions, I need a motion to vote that we join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. We have a motion? Yeah. I can make uh, a motion. Okay. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question, Warren? No, I thought we were seconding. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So I need a motion <laughs> to join. Yeah, I, I make a motion that we join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Um, and a second. Warren, did you want to second it? Sure. Yes, second. <laughs> okay. So now we'll vote. So Lauren, voting on joining the PV. <clears throat> Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. And Nancy, aye. Okay. Now the second half is yes. the opt-out discussion for aerial spraying. Yes. Jen, 
Do you want to? Yeah, so, so thank you for that. So then the second thing that we need to discuss, and this is something that you talked about last year, is do we want to vote to opt out of spraying conducted by the State Reclamation Mosquito Control Board? Um, so this is something um, that um, is something that, you know, is important um, to understand, you know, the process, I, I believe, of what a phased response is and what the surveillance um, response and response plan would be if there was triple E um, detected. You know, there's these risk categories and then recommended responses. So it would be a remote level that um, there's no triple E activity. If there's sporadic um, isolations of mosquitoes, you know, um, that have been detected, but no animal and human, you know, uh, cases, then we'd be considered low. So there's a response for moderate. What do we do if we move up to moderate, meaning that there are cases, human cases, and then it goes to a higher level. So um, I think historically the town has said that this is something that they do not want to support. When, and I say that because I've read emails from last year um, that were written to the Hampshire Gazette, um, and I believe that's what people had wanted last year. Um, so I think the board needs to decide if it's something that we want to choose not to do. Um, that's a decision that I will um, move up to the town council um, the 16th. If that's what you do decide, there's a process um, <clears throat> to opt out and it's a simple one. There's a checklist and then there's some questions to ask. And I've started drafting um, an email about what we would do, um, uh, what are we able to do if we are deciding to opt out. And like I said, we have a really long history here in this department of being very proactive with education, um, for example, and community outreach. Um, one thing that we have done, um, which I kind of like, is that I don't have my narrative in front of me, is that um, we have uh, used something called, for example, the bite board we get from the Department of Public Health. It's at UMass and someone's gone through and they've taken different mosquitoes, they put it out and there's educational pieces and then looping videos. We've had that plane here at the Bang Center. We've sent it to the library. We've created a trifold here. We've created education about where um, mosquito bites happen, when mosquito bites happen, you know, dust to dawn, we've had it translated into other um, languages. And we also not to underplay, you know, how important um, orange paper and a laminator and a good stapler is because we really go out to the areas of kiosks at areas um, that playing fields, uh, you know, Groth Park we really can advertise. And our IT department is incredible at talking about um, different risk modification. So if that's something that uh, the board wants, um, I think we really have a very good um, <clears throat> plan in place for community outreach. Um, I would say that I think opting out of spraying is something that I would um, take a second look at. I think if we ever got to that point that we really were weighing risks, uh, the risk of, of humans becoming sick and possibly dying, is that something that we, we don't wanna have in our, in, our, in our back pocket and be able to do. Um, so I'm, I think that we should not opt out, but I don't know if that's what the board wants or, or town town members. Questions, comments? Um, well, Sorry. I think if it, I think even if towns choose to opt out, if the Department of Health, health in the Massachusetts declares that there is a public health emergency, the state will do aerial spraying. They'll work with the mosquito control boards, but you can't like opt out completely because if there's a public health emergency, the state board, the reclamation board or whatever is going to do spraying. 
So I, you know, I, so it balance sort of, you know, I think they don't do it. They wouldn't come in at before that level, but they would if it was considered a public health emergency. I think it'd be very transparent. It'd be very obvious when if we were getting to that point, no one would be caught off guard. That's for sure. Right. So it just that wasn't clear to me last year, and I didn't actually. It was hard to find that documentation last year. This year, things are seem a little more transparent about how this all works and or would work. Um, so it, it is opting out of the state program, but only up to a, a point. I don't know if that makes a difference in how people think about it. Well, uh, I was, I thought we would be in favor of opting out of spring if we just voted on um, the PCMCD that seems like it's more as you said, you know, localized. And so one of my questions is if you opt out, is that just for a year? And I just I just thought from from the last vote that we would want to opt out. So I'm a little confused now. So, oh, you know, I think, um, <clears throat> like I said, it, it's sort of, it, it's, it's two separate things. You know, we really, we've decided that we want to join this, this, uh, the Pioneer Valley, the, this district. They have these different um, pieces that we want to be part of, you know, the education, the surveillance. But now a second part is the opting out of the spring through the state reclamation board. Um, so I have to say that, um, you know, I've been reading on this. I thought the aerial spraying um, wouldn't happen over certified organic farms. So I, I am saying that, you know, when we go to the town council, I'm going to be having somebody um, from, from the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District to talk about the opting out and actually what it would mean, a real, a real expert that can mm -hmm. just tell me what's what. There is some controversy about how effective aerial spraying is in, in reducing risk, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you're, I don't know that much about it, but it, it's not cl how clear how effective it is because it in reducing the populations because they just kind of can't get them all and they just breed really fast, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, And the question is, you know, what what side effects that has on the environment in terms of, of beneficial um, insects and birds and fish and everything else. So that that's one of the reasons I think a lot of people would like to to avoid that if at all possible. Right. Um, I think you know it's Anvil ten ten. Is that how it's said? That's the. Um, the pesticide that's been used, and it has two um, active ingredients in it. I don't know the inert substances in it. I think people mm -hmm. would be interested in that. Um, yeah. Tim, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I think if we are opting for the M. PVMCD, that's a different one. I think it gives us a lot of information. But uh, my only concern is by opting out, I, of course, you know, I think if, the, if you are in a critical stage, uh, even if you opt out, there's going to be spraying by the state. That, that's going to happen. But given that many of, uh, many, many in the Amherst are actually spending a lot of time outdoors nowadays. Mm -hmm. With the past two years hadn't been um, isolated now I think engaging with nature and um, so I'm just wondering um, if 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 the exposure is going to be higher in the coming season uh, you know are we putting ourselves you know even though the map on the website says that we are low in terms of risk right now no. Oh, uh, right now. No, no. I mean, yeah, uh, this year, not the historical one. Oh, 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's too early. It's yeah. Yeah. May. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, and, you know, uh, how that turns out when people, more people are outdoors engaged and everything. Of course, we can educate them with dawn to dust, don't go out and cancel all the meetings and everything. So that's the only concern I have, you know, if we opt out um, and if, uh, if there is going to be cases emerging, what do we do about it? You know? So we have to wait till the crisis occurs where there is heavy crisis load and then the state is forcing to, forced to spray on spray on the you know state and so that's the only uh, so it's it's a it's a trade off we have to decide in terms of environmental impacts versus life impacts you know now i'm with you tim you know 50% of me says oh my god don't spray that's awful for the environment mm -hmm. and people and then the other 50% of me says well if it gets so bad that we have a chance of our kids and us getting Tripoli or West Nile, we really have to do everything we can possibly do to prevent because people die from Tripoli. Um, and that's very serious. So, you know, and the other thing is if it, I, I mean, I'm just saying if it really got to this critical stage, you know, I, I feel like the town could rally and figure out, you know, where fine, we could get finances to spray. I don't know if that's true or not, but we wouldn't just sit by and say, oh, well. I, I think the Pioneer Valley, the folks at Pioneer, the Pioneer Valley Control Board could give us a lot of information about what they can do. I think they don't, maybe don't do the aerial spraying, but they, the larvicidal mm -hmm. um, applications that use um, like biologic, like Bacillus thurgiensis or something to, to kind of kill the larvae are things that they would come in is this that, that integrated pest management system mm -hmm. i think they can probably do things that will help but it you know but it sounds like they won't be able to do the spring and from what i read on that application i have a feeling that we would not because amherst is listed now as a historically a high risk place and pioneer valley can, Mosquito Control Board doesn't do the aerial or truck spraying, um, it would be rejected. But you know, our, our request would be rejected. But I, obviously, I don't know that. I, I think um, it seems to say that in the documents that in the documents that the, uh, the application. Yeah, and I, um, I know it, it does make mention that high risk communities are carrying a burden for the region. You know, so it's right not and it right it, and. And, you know, I was surprised that we actually fell into high risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think Granby did. I don't think Belcher did. I, it was, look, it looked, the map looked strange to me, but I, I don't, I don't know quite how that, that the, how they determine all that. But, um, you know, cause I actually went back and looked over the years that, and, and the, the risk for Triple E has only been mod level raised as moderate in 2019 and 2014 on the mm -hmm. data that I could find. Um, but again, I think they changed the way they are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. West Nile virus, we've had more trouble with, but that, that's not quite as serious yeah. a problem. And it's a different problem. It's really your tires and your bottle caps and your you know, yeah. water and your bird bath or whatever that are more of a problem for that. Plant saucers and... Yeah, yeah. Small, smaller water sources. Um, I think the historical risk mapping is not just looking at the cases within a town, but they also look yeah. at a broader range yeah. of towns, you know. So yeah, that know. historical it's, risk is... But the area where, seemed like... Yeah, I think so we are on the edge. <laughs> yeah. I think we are. And I think what South Hadley, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, I don't know, it just like didn't quite make 100% sense to me. And I think it has to do like with what Jennifer was talking about, what habitats we have and how much, how many yeah. acres of, of that. And if you look at Lawrence Swamp and, and other air, wetland areas in Amherst, it's quite significant. Mm -hmm. And I just have a question. Right over the, the border in Hadley, you know, it, 
right next to UMass. There's a whole wetlands thing, but I, I believe it's- But they're not high there. risk. <laughs> yeah, 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 but they come <laughs> over to the Amherst playing fields. Lauren, you had a question? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, um, the, with the state services for um, mosquito management, um, I don't know if you guys know the answer, but is there like a certain amount of times that they just spray regularly, whether there's a issue or not? And again, with the opt out, is there a certain time frame, and then you can opt back in, or because I, I just I, this is new to me. I've been unaware of spraying since the seventies. They used to spray right. the I don't, chrysanthemum th stuff. I, they haven't sprayed. There's not a routine. It's not a routine thing through the state. Um, the, I think the okay. state has also adopted this integrated pest management program. I think, I think there's some concern about some of the mosquito control districts that they wanna kind of get in line with, with a more modern approach. Um, but one thing that I was reading is there, in terms of surveillance, there hasn't been much surveillance outside, you know, by the state itself outside of these mosquito control districts. So they, mm -hmm. they haven't been like routinely doing a lot of surveillance in non mosquito control district areas. So there's a lot less information about areas like that, like Amherst. And uh, this Anvil 1010 um, is supposed to biodegrade quickly with sunlight and microorganisms. It, it is, and I'm reading that from a, a paper I printed out from the CDC. So I, I, I don't have too much information. that I can tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at their uh, website and uh, um, about more details about this Anvil 1010, Sumitrin mm -hmm. and Phenothrin. Uh, this is for the Central Ma Mass Mosquito Control Project. Yeah, and that's they say that. Have. Yeah, that, they say that it biodegrades with sunlight and microorganisms quickly. You know. <coughs> Yeah, that's and right. it's an adulticide. It's a what? It's an adult is adult side. It's not a larvicide or yeah, just the adults. Yeah. Rapidly, rapidly inactivated and decomposes with exposure to light and air, yeah. with a half life of less than one day. Yeah. <coughs> and the, and the active ingredients are also common in household pest, pest control products like for ants and wasps and fleas and tick shampoos, mm. <laughs> <laughs> licensed cabbies, you know, shampoos and stuff like that. So. I'm looking at something that says uh, the Anvil 1010 can be sprayed by a truck, from a truck. Yeah. And yeah. Okay, so you don't have to spray it from the air. I think there's different ways to do it. I think um, it probably it, depends on what where you're trying to get it to go. You know, you, some things might not be accessible by a truck. Yeah. yeah. So, so what 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 are we deciding on with the opt out? What what would be the well? That's what we have to have a motion for. <laughs> yeah. I know, but but are there more pros than cons? I just I'm a I'm Lauren is, sure. yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to, to cut you off. I'm okay. sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, it is a lot. I'm not an expert. This is something that I know before I was uh, the director, you know, last year it was discussed. So it's something that comes up from time to time. So what we decide, what the board decides tonight will be noted and we'll send to the town council. And then on the 16th, 
<clears throat> excuse me, if your decision is to opt out, that's a recommendation to the town council. They'll say, oh, okay, thank you. But I also plan on having someone help me with a presentation. So the town council will have a public comment and there'll be a lot of questions and this will be picked apart, um, this discussion. So we're not making the ultimate decision for the town right, right now. Right. Well, I say opt out. What did you say, Lauren? I say we should make the motion to opt out of the date. Okay, um, okay. do you want to make the motion? So Lauren yes. is making the motion to opt out of Mosquito Spring. They need a, a second. I'll second that. Any more discussion? They will vote. Tim? Um, I'm, I'm, as I was saying, like 50-50 on this, uh, opting out is very easy. But if uh, PVMCD doesn't have the capability to spray, until they get the capability, I think we should get the help from state. Okay, so you're voting no to opt out. Yeah. Maureen? I would vote yes to opt out. I'm and not I'm sure it's going to work, but I would support that. <laughs> you can help me draft the letter. Oh, no, I'll draft it and you can check it. Warren? I say yes to the opt-out. All right, so I have to decide. Oh, my heavens. I'll say no to opting out. So that's a tie vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, on Steve. Yeah. <laughs> So um, well, it sends a message. But, I mean, but that's exactly it. Both both Tim and I have said it's 50-50, and guess what? That's what the yeah, point no, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's because hard to if, know exactly if we, what these things mean. If we opt out and we need spraying, uh, my understanding from reading it is we're stuck with that bill. The town. But not, I don't think so. I think if there's an emergency, the state is going to do it anyway. I think there are areas that considered a public but, health emergency. That's my that understanding. Is, I don't know if we have to pay for it, but <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what happens normally when the state does it. Do they charge the towns for their services? I have no I, idea. I don't know, but I, somewhere in reading all that, I thought we're stuck with the bill. That I, is I, I uh, might be wrong, but. No, if we have a crisis, state will support us. They will, they will spray. But okay. if we have an approaching uh, emergency, say, for example, towns closer to us are having high number of cases and we are not having any cases, that will be an approaching emergency. So in those cases, I think we have to proactively spray. Mm -hmm. And then we're stuck and, with that. Bill. Yeah, we'll be stuck with those bills you, in those cases. I'm sorry. And you also said that if Amherst is considered high risk, then we may not be able to opt out in the first place. Yeah, that's yeah. my reading of what the application says, whether that's only one factor in their decision about whether you can opt out or and it's a more general look at everything else you're doing or whether that's a, a you know hard and fast rule. It, I have no idea. I mean, I think this whole process is new right in terms of this whole opting out and how to apply and yeah. uh and evolving Simplified. evolving process yeah. simplified yeah so we really needed a little bit more information about who's when we're who gets stuck with the bill if it becomes a true emergency <laughs> so i agree right. I, I bet the, the pioneer valley got guys will probably know what that means yeah i think i think it'd be great to have somebody really upfront and able to talk yeah. and answer some questions, hard, hard questions. Okay. So thank you. Now the director's update. 
All right, thanks everybody. So I want to give a COVID update. Um, the, the board members um, were sent some of the data, but I think we- Thank you for that. That yeah. was very helpful seeing yeah. that data. Yeah, you're welcome. So our numbers have been going up um, and I think we all know that these cases are underreported or underestimated. Um, the actual um, COVID level of COVID is probably much higher because people aren't testing and then the rapid antigens aren't reported. Um, so our numbers are going up. I looked at what we are today because the state comes out Thursday night at 5 p.m. So our numbers are inching up. For example, overnight, <clears throat> we had 27 new cases come in. Um, we have an active caseload of 260 right now. The last time it was that that level um, goes back to March, the beginning of March. So what the state put out this, um, this week is, oops, I just, um, is that our 14-day um, incidence rate last week was 49.7. This week is 52.2. Um, our 14-day average positivity rate is 3.25. Last week was 2.8. Um, the state average is 5.11, and we're at 3.25. Um, so we have our numbers um, going up, but also we know that the CDC um, is really having us look less at case counts and more at hospitalizations or acute cases and bed capacity and looking at deaths. And those are all pretty stable right now. Um, I wanna let you know that I called you mass. I said, hey, can you give us any information on sequencing? So we're approximately 95% of BA2 and 10% approximately of that is some subvariant of that. And I don't have information on what the subvariant is. Um, I don't know if it's BA2.12, I just don't know. Um, when you break down the cases, pretty consistently what we're seeing is about 73% are between the ages of 18 to 26 year olds and the rest um, trickles out into other age groups. Um, when we do contact tracing, some of these um, cases can be uh, linked to dorm parties and social events. And I know I say this, but it's sort of normal activities um, in abnormal times. The cases that have been in the general population has, have also been mostly attributed to social events and going through households. Um, we're not seeing spread out in the community, for example, like I'm not hearing um, about, um, you know, restaurant spread, anything like that. The other things, public health key indicators that we also keep in, in, in mind, at least, you know, I do is like, what season are we in? So winter, you know, everyone was inside. We're spring with better ventilation. Um, the testing ability, the PCR ended, but we still have rapid antigen tests and we have wastewater testing that I'm gonna get to after this. <clears throat> When I speak, um, when I listen to the Department of Public Health um, weekly webinars, what they're saying is there was a question is um, someone said, are we ever gonna be talking about masks soon or physical distancing? And what DPH is saying that we really need to focus on vaccination. Um, and I know from my own you know, interactions, people say that Omicron has been uh, mild, but it's not mild. It's just that we're well vaccinated. So we need to keep the vaccination going. Um, vaccines are doing exactly what we want them to do. They're reducing severe disease and preventing death. Um, and just a reminder, it's still two weeks after your booster to get that effect of the vaccine. Stay home. So this is from DPH saying, stay home if you're sick. Um, test, notify your contacts if you're sick. And just a reminder to everybody, antivirals are important. Um, and then ventilation is something that we, we talk about, but maybe really need the word out um, about 
better filtration of mask and uh, your risk um, assessment and ventilation. And then I'm gonna mention one thing that I really like from the New York Times. They said that everyone should have a backup plan. And so that's just a little bit of education that I've really been giving people that if, and these are two examples that people gave me that they thought it was gonna be um, a small gathering at their aunt's house on the deck, but they went in and everyone was inside in front of the TV. So really, you know, have a backup plan. So, so do you wanna be there? Um, and inside with poor ventilation. The other example someone gave me is they, they saw that there was a church fair. This is in a different town and um, there's a photograph. It was supposed to be outside, but they went there, it was a rainy day and it was in the basement and was very crowded. So they decided to leave. So th th I think my point is there's some risk uh, assessment that we need to be um, thinking about for ourselves. Excuse me. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? I can go into wastewater surveillance. In that I'm interested. Uh, how about the schools, Jennifer? How, I, I know we had that little burst, uh, sort of significant burst uh, yeah. of cases at the high school before this vacation. And my sense of that is it's settled down some, but, but there's a steadier number of cases a higher but steady number of cases in all yeah. spread through all the schools. Yeah, so I speak to um, the lead nurse, the nurse manager every week there, and we go over the cases, but also we communicate during the week. And what she has told me is that, again, these are cases that are going through families. They're happening at social events um, that sometimes happen after school events. They're being very proactive. The prom is coming, their socials coming, um, giving people antigen tests and asking them to test before they go, they go in. So I think um, I would tell you that there's no, to my knowledge, um, contact tracing or spread in the classrooms. Um, so that's something that I'm not aware of and haven't been told it's happening um, in, other, in other situations. Yeah, the middle school had its social last week. Uh, excuse me for the cough. I'm gonna segment into wastewater testing. Um, so I know we were always talking about layered approaches um, to, to COVID mitigation. So I feel like we took some things away when we took away the PCR testing. But what we have now is we have wastewater testing through the department, um, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. So we met, met with them two weeks ago and we asked if we could do testing here in Amherst. And we really tried to woo them. We said, you know, we have the infrastructure, we have the leadership, we can do this. We're used to disseminating information. And I met with uh, Dr. Monima Clevens. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her first name. And she's like, absolutely. So they were right on board from the beginning. So working with the Department of Public Works, um, what we're doing is we're taking um, wastewater samples three times a week. <clears throat> And the um, composite sample is representative of all the buildings, homes, businesses that contribute to wastewater in the Amherst wastewater treatment plan. So that includes Amherst College, Am Hampshire College, and UMass. Um, we run the samples three times a week. We send it to Jamaica Plain, and then Biobot is actually analyzing it for us. This is under a grant, so we're doing this through June, and then hopefully we can just continue it on. Um, <clears throat> the testing results are going to go onto our dashboard tomorrow. Um, we've received four results so far. I think last, um, last week was our, our first or two weeks ago. Um, so the thing that we really want to drive home is, is like lots of us are used to, you know, analyzing an instance for, you know, rate and positivity rate. Well, this is kind of new for us, this um, copies per milliliter copies per liter but really what we want to look at is the trend and you'll see tomorrow when we post it that the trend of cases and wastewater really do mirror each other they really parallel so it really does give us um it's going to reflect the trends in the the burden of covid in town um 
So I think that's something that we can really um, make sure that we understand. Uh, John, has, has, the DPH, has DPH recommended how we use this data? Um, so uh, what, what they say is similar to um, you know, the CDC that it's this can be used as an early warning Okay. Um, but but when you talk about it, has this really been studied that that this you see this trend and then its response is this I don't think there's a correlation there, but I think the more information we have. Um, okay, thank you. Oh, well, that's a lot of fun. So uh, I have a quick question. Uh, <clears throat> the number of cases among 20 to 29 are around that young age is very high, right? In mm -hmm. terms of the caseload. And given that UMass and the regional college are some sort of a wrapping up for summer, so we should expect some sort of the caseload to go down. Yeah, I think when you look at um, Hampshire County, you know, in the CDC COVID levels, we've gone from green to moderate, so green to yellow. And we're, Amherst is really driving that, that number up. So I think we really need to be sensitive about what we do as a response, the Board of Health, the Health Department. I know we have people asking about mass mandate, but I think we need to look at trends and not fluctuations. And I think we'll see um, a, a dip um, after graduation. Should I keep on going to my next item? Canning salons, yeah. Yeah, it could roll okay. up to 742. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're... So this is something that was on my mind. I don't know if I should have put it on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> but I we do not have any tanning salons in the town of Amherst right now. In the past, we have had some. So I'm wondering if this is something that we want to consider saying we don't want tanning salons in Amherst because of the health risks. Um, I think it's going to be something that we need to, I need to speak to town hall. I you need to speak to a town lawyer? Do we need to speak to the bid about this? But I just want to see if it's something that we should pursue sort of, you know, you know, with the health risks um, of eye damage, skin cancer. Is it something the board would consider? Or should I just sit on this for a while and do a little more research? Um, I'm happy we don't have any more because I remember hearing students say, oh, I'm going tanning. Oh, I'm going tanning. Um, I wonder if the trend is going out. Um, let me do some more research. Yeah, let me do that. What do other people think? I, I, I think uh, it's not a question of Amherst alone. <laughs> if Amherst proactively says no, students are going to Hadley or Northampton. <laughs> I mean, people, you know, students who want to do that, they will do it, you know. So, so I think uh, in terms of research, I think we have to see how effective will be and if we do much more localized or if it's a regional one, that might be more effective. Good, thank you. Well, although one of the things like that is like, as, as, an, as towns start to do that, maybe other towns will follow suit too. So, you know, and then the state get, gets an idea too. So it's a lot of public health in Massachusetts seems to come from the towns up. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to know more about, about the, you know, specifically the risks and also what other regulations maybe other places have. And uh, is there a list of tanning salons? How many are there? There used to be one on University Drive. Yeah, there are none right now. But there are none now, so. Yeah. So I was thinking it would But be I wonder if other towns. Yeah, I don't know, in Hadley, are this there is any? Is now? Or is it now everybody puts that lotion on to make themselves? Oh, <laughs> Okay. Anything else, Jen? I'm all set. Thank you. We have public comment. But the public gave up on us. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> we outlast them. 
I know everybody got the email from Darcy Dumont. Um, also, Jennifer Taub, who is a town councilor, reached out to me and she wants to talk about um, the, the recycling and composting. So I said, yeah, we could talk about it and I'd bring that information to you. Um, and then topics not anticipated by the chair. There's two things. One is Steve's term is up in June. Is that correct? Um, yes. Um, um, and I've notified um, uh, town hall and uh, when we get and so there's a, a, a notice that puts out uh, put out that we're looking for applicants. So when we get five or six, we'll be notified. And, we'll and um, I can't remember what we did for John, but I'm willing to get a card and bring it to the health department if people want to sign a card for Steve. You know, he did all those minutes. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I can I can get a card and we can circulate it. We can come to you if that helps. Okay. Well, thank you, Jen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, I've been the chair for I don't know how many years, and I really need if I'm going to be doing the precepting of the students for phase two and three, I really need to step down as chair. So I would like people to consider. Um, becoming a chair. Um, we can talk about it in June, but I, especially if there's going to be focus groups and all that going on in the fall, I, I really can't be a chair and, and be part of um, phase three. And any other comments for the good of the board? Okay. Can would you oh, would you still be on the board, but just not the chair? I'd still be on the board, just not the oh. chair. I have another year. I think it's another year to my term. Uh, and then uh, I've been on for so many years. I'll, I'll be off. So I will be on until I guess it's next June. I don't know what months they all start or didn't start because. At one point, it was extended till October, and then it was extended another year. And so I don't know. Um, anything else? Not. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Okay. When is the next meeting? <laughs> Our next Our meeting is June 9th. and I need a second. I second it. Okay, so Tim. Hi. Maureen. Hi. Lauren. Hi. Nancy, I. And thank you all. Um, and see you in June. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jen, for thank everything. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.